Hello, 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 and welcome. I'm up here now, uh, for this stream at least. Hello and welcome to Magic the Gathering, the arena. What? It's not called MTGTA. Magic the Gathering, colon, arena. I'm going to interject and say hello everyone and welcome <laughs> to this final boss fight air guitarist playing of Magic the Gathering Arena. I'm joined by John. Hi, that would be me. <laughs> and I'm, 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 joined. I'm joined by Chris. Hello. And we thought that uh, we wanted to play more Magic the Gathering Arena. It's a good start. Um, basically, Magic the Gathering Arena, for anybody who doesn't know what it is, it's the Magic the Gathering card game, but in computer format, and it is free to play, which is very different from Magic the Gathering Normal, which is not so free to play. Yeah, it's, it's, I, I played a lot during the, the beta, um, I did that with air quotes for those on John's stream. Um, and <laughs> they were quite... Um, they they did give you, you know, plenty of currency, plenty of XP, plenty of free packs. Um, I don't know if they've wound back on that, but they've definitely added more to the store. Um, they've def I think they've definitely reeled in how much they give out for free. Yeah. A little yeah. bit, but it is still very much a free to play game. Yeah, and you've got cool new, cool new kind of like online progression that they've put in here with the mastery system, and you've got avatars, and you've got deck sleeves, and uh, I think you've even got minions now, like little things that you got pets. Yeah, so they're definitely having some of that, like kind of. Um... So I would say it's a is is freemium the right word? Yeah, it it. It feels like a, a the perfect example of a freemium game, which is also you know, Magic: The Gathering itself is is sort of the basis of most freemium games in that you can pay a little bit to play normally, but the more you pay, the better the stuff you can play with is. Yeah. If you know what you're so. doing, or so. if you're not lucky. Because I know that I know that, for instance, one year I bought a uh, I bought a starter set, and with the two um, the two booster decks I got in my starter set, I uh, got one card that was a mythic rare card for that set. I sold it on eBay and made enough money to go to Comic Con mm, with one card. Um... I I uh, I used to I used to play this um, used to play the TCG a lot um, you, know, you know twice twice a week at the at my LGC um, I've spent a good couple of thousand pounds on cards um, creating my own decks acquiring trading you know getting I, the only thing I didn't really do is is attend like a, a live event you know. Yeah, I never considered myself good enough, but you know, I feel like I should should have gone just for the atmosphere, as like everyone enjoying the same hobby. <laughs> um, and you know, it, the precursor to I mean, I've sold my de I sold my decks and didn't recoup as much as I probably could have, but I definitely got a fair chunk of it back. Um, so, basically, I thought it would be interesting if. The two of us who know, obviously Chris knows a, you know, a decent amount about magic, and I know some stuff about how to play magic. If we did a stream that was sort of, not necessarily a beginner's how to play guide, but a simple stream of magic and sort of discuss some of the basics and some of the what is happening, because I know that there's a lot of people who do stream magic who are very good at it, who, oh my gosh, yes. who talk at a level they that is... like tempo. 
that is very inside baseball, and they know what is happening. Out, yeah, and value, and and obviously with some of those, with some of those, I know what that means. But for someone who I know that I've played this a couple of times and mentioned it in Discord calls that I'm doing this, and I get people saying. I've liked the idea of magic, but I have had no idea of how to play or how to start or what is happening. Yeah. And that is fair. It is not... It isn't incredibly it's straightforward. Easy, it's easy to pick up, difficult to master in a way that... So you can grab like a pre-built or one of the game like decks um, and... It's it gives you a general idea of how to play. And hmm. Magic the Gathering um, is one of the oldest things I was taught about Magic the Gathering is its rules. There are no like turn to page four hundred fifty six of the rule book to find out what this card does because it will tell you on the card. And the great thing about Magic the Gathering cards is anything written on a Magic the Gathering card will trump the rules. The card always wins. It's it's uh, it's the general thing of specific beats general and reading the card tells you what the card does. Exactly. Um, some people don't get the the subtleties of the color wheel, but um, hopefully myself and John will break it down simply enough. Each color of the magic world, of which there are five: white, green, blue, red, black. And there's now colorless. Um, they all have specific feels and themes, and if you play a certain color, you're going to be expected to perform to play in a certain, certain tropes. Yeah, exactly. And the the cool thing is, is when you mesh two colors um, in what they call um, guilds. Now, what they're called guilds, and there is a guild for every potent, every possible color variation. I think. Yes. Um, you, your playstyle doesn't change much, but you take on the traits of both of those colors. Red's really aggro, um, and by aggro means it attacks fast, it has lots of little creatures, burn spells, direct damage. It um, does a lot of damage very quickly with low-cost spells and low-cost creatures that you get in one and two cost creatures quite quickly yeah. and you do a lot of damage very quickly ideally before the other person's deck gets a chance to do what it's meant to yeah and say you pair that or you you say blue is your control it has lots of counter magic makes you dictate the pace of the game has a couple of big finishes there's lots of things like unblockable or counter spells or what we call bounce spells which return creatures to the hand and if you pair the two together in for this is an example in what's called the is it league you get a mix of both you don't get the full strength of saying playing a single color but you do get a nice miss map you get a mix a mixture of both play styles in one deck and certain people favor playing boros for example which is white reds or you know, um, the Gruul clans or the Golgari, different color combinations. And I think people, my um, favor is, is it Demir is black, blue? Uh, Demir is... Or blue, black. Yes, Demir is blue, black. That's all about subterfuge and using the control <laughs> elements of blue with the destruction elements of black. Um, some people like playing pure color decks some people play colorless decks some people play um five color decks three color decks four color decks it's i mean as i as i was uh explaining the other night after we finished the games that we were playing on was it saturday or sunday mm -hmm. um i think it was saturday um i was trying to explain to uh Rekia the chromanticore <laughs> I don't know if you remember the Chromanticore. Oh, I remember the Chromanticore. Uh, but that that was a five-color card, and one of the few, one of the few officially printed five-color cards from a time when it was feasibly possible to play it. Mm -hmm. 
um, which was an interesting time for magic. Yeah, I think we're um, we're kind of drifting away from our core of simplicity. Yeah, let's um, uh, let let's, so let's focus go back down. To, yeah. So, do we want to do a a quick round, a quick match where we do both play a mono color deck? Absolutely, I'm I'm down for that. Do you want to um, spin a spin a color wheel, perhaps? Oh, I I was not prepared for attempting to spin wheels, but I can do one moment. Okay, I'm going to do a browser capture of this of a wheel spinner as well. Wheeldecide.com. Can we capture this? Red, black. Apply wheels. Not gonna be the right one option. Red, blue, black, green, white. We don't actually have Magic the Gathering thing. It's gonna be really confusing for people, but you know what? Fine. Um, let's add in. So this is. Source. Wait, you're ahead of me. Well, apparently I'm eating French food. I may have not actually saved my wheel. <laughs> okay, are you ready to spin your wheel? Um, um, let me try... Also, we're not sponsored by Tom Clancy, Ghost Recon, Breakpoint, whatever that is that's being advertised there. Um, but... You know what? Fine. Oh, I can't click to spin it. Oh, wait. I just need to do a window capture. Okay, I'm going to spin mine. You spin your wheels. I'm going to play the red deck. Okay. I'm going to make sure... If I, if I end up spinning red... This could end up bad. So that would be the Dragonfire deck. Is that not going to capture? You know what? Screw it. I'm just going to spin it. Just spin it. We'll trust you. Oh, good. No, it's fine. Did you, did you get red as well? No, 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 no. It's fine. Uh, right, okay. Did you get a colour you don't like? Uh, I got red. I'm spinning again. Red. It says red. I'm spinning again. Uh, can I? There we go. Okay, so I've quickly had a look at the deck list. Uh, there, are, there are some cards in there. Okay, I have black. So I'm picking out for blood. Uh, I've also applied the fancy style of cards that I have from completing the mastery of this deck. Oh no, have you been playing without me? I've leveled up my account a little bit. Okay, I should probably do that at some point. I only have the Is It League deck sleeves from ages ago, so... <laughs> Fine... Um, it's just I like the fancy you... full art cards they do for like. Oh, I want so bad. Uh, now you do a direct challenge. Direct challenge. Yes. And I should be able to pick John. So there are phases in magic. And oh, good put, start. Don't be put off by phases. Phases um, 
MTGA does a really good job of holding your hand through the phases. And the tutorial that you get when you're a first-time player is also incredibly good. Note to self, turn the volume down. <laughs> oh, this is not a great opening hand. Uh, my hand is good. So at the start of the game, you get deal a hand of seven cards. You want to make sure you've got at least three. Um three lands because lands are how you play spells so i've got that and i'm keeping my hand so i'm going to just talk through this quickly i've got three cards of mountains because that's my mana base uh what i don't have is a lot to do with it very quickly and because i'm playing a red deck i want to be able to play cards Ideally, I'm looking for a card to play on the first turn and possibly the second turn to be in my opening hand. Now, I've got one that I can play on the second turn, which is fine, but then these other three cards are very high-powered cards that ideally I will want later in the game, not in my opening hand. And traditionally, I wouldn't know this. Um... So the options are I can keep this and hope that I'm going to draw decent cards when I draw cards, or I can mulligan and hope that I still get a decent land selection as well as stuff to do with it. So I think I'm going to mulligan, which means that I put these cards back and get new cards out. Now... With Magic the Gathering uh, Arena, we're doing the London Mulligan, which is you then draw seven cards and keep six of them. Why is it called a London Mulligan? Uh, I have no idea. Me neither. Uh, so this, I've got two cards I can play on the second turn or the second and third turns. So I think I'm going to keep this and see if I can get something to play in the first turn on my first draw. Doesn't seem likely. And then I'm going to put one of these big level creatures back in my deck to come back again later on. Okay, so the reason it's called a London Mulligan is that it was first introduced in the London Protocol. That ah, is well, there we go. Point. Right, so it's my turn. Um, there are key phases... Um, there's your um, untap, upkeep, and draw. They normally all ha always happen at once, and you probably won't be delving into them except to untap your lands and draw a card. So untap, you untap everything. Uh, upkeep, you pay any upkeep cost. Draw, you draw a card. Then it's your first main phase, and there's two of those. You get a main phase, a combat phase, and a second main phase, and then there's your end step. So in the, in, in your one of your main phases... Once per turn, you may play a land. I play a swamp, and because I can't do anything, the game moves on. Similarly, I play a mountain, and I can't do anything else, so the game has moved back to so Chris. On top of these cards, you can see these skulls and numbers. Um, and the skulls indicate I would need to pay a black mana. You can see the skull here, if you mouse over my swamp. Uh, and then the two represents two of any other mana. So some cards may ask specifically for a color of mana, so in this case, black. Um, and because we're playing monocolor decks, they're only ever going to ask for black. Uh, and the two represents any other mana or colorless mana. So if I put another land down, you can see by my card casting costs, I have two mana, but I don't have anything that will actually work except this card, but as you can see by the card text it needs a target it needs a target so, so i'm gonna to... i'm gonna play a mana are you gonna play a card i'm gonna play a card i don't know if i should because i now know that you've got something to target a card but it could be that you can target your own creatures and not mine and also i'm not going to cheat and know things that i shouldn't know <laughs> uh so i've got these goblin instigators 
And when the goblin instigator enters the battlefield, I get to create a 1-1 one, one red goblin creature. So it's, it is a one power and one toughness creature that when it enters the field, creates another one power, one toughness creature. And I will choose. So what happened there was, is that a card went on what's called the stack. And I know this is a lot to take in, and it happens very quickly, but the stack is just basically the order of which cards are played. When John plays a card, I get a chance to respond to him playing a card, and then he gets to respond to me if I play a card, and so on. And the stack builds up, and then goes down in reverse order, um, starting from the most recent action to the original action, uh, and everything just plays out like that. And Obviously, with Magic the Gathering Arena... It's it's really helpfully it does all of the maths and that sort of thing for you, which is very nice. Mm -hmm. It can be a little bit longer if you need to do the maths yourself. Uh, if you're playing with the actual paper cards. So as you can see, when I when I mouse over a card here, the mana lights up to say this is the mana I'm going to use to cast this spell. The blue outline says you can play these cards you have that much mana um, and you can manually tap the mana yourself you can click to tap to add one mana to your mana pool and do it that way or you can just drag a card um, and it will automatically handle all of that for you obviously if you're playing in real life you will have to you'll have to turn the card yourself I'm afraid that's uh... you, You've noticed that the cards turn sideways, which means you can't use them anymore until your next turn when you enter your untap step. So turning them sideways is tapping them, and untapping them is turning them straight up. So um, the one time in Magic the Gathering Arena that you're really going to be wanting to pay attention to what colours of mana you are tapping is if you are playing a multicolour deck, you might want to keep certain colours of mana open to play a card later the the auto tapper is fairly good but it sometimes will tap it, it doesn't necessarily know what you're going to do later on mm -hmm. uh, so now I've got a fancy card that I can play that is a fancy card and I'm going to hit Chris in the face with it ow my face uh, so when when Viashino Pyromancer enters the battlefield, it deals two damage to a target player. I could have hit myself in the face, but that would be silly, because then I take damage. If I had something that wanted me to take damage for some reason, it doesn't say that it has to hit my opponent, it just hits a target player or planeswalker. Do you know about right-clicking on cards, John? I did not know that. There you go. I will, I will bear that in mind. I was just hovering over them. Now, I could attack at this point, but Chris has a spinal centipede on the battlefield, uh, which will block and kill one of my creatures, because my creatures are very low toughness. When a creature attacks, it deals its power in damage, but if it is dealt its toughness in damage to itself, it dies. So, so neither of my cards, goblins... On the cards, power is the first number. In the bottom right, power is the first number, and the toughness is the second number. So it has three attack points and three health, uh, two health points. So, so neither of my goblins have that much power to be able to get through the centipede and largely what they would do is one of them will run into the centipede and be eaten by it or die to it and the other one will run up and slap Chris in the face mm -hmm. uh, so I could attack now, deal one damage to Chris and lose a goblin or I could wait but that wouldn't be very red of you, would it? It wouldn't be incredibly red of me, but it would be red of me to know that there are things coming that might change the, change that mechanic. Right. Uh, so I'm going to just pass the turn to Chris and let Chris uh, worry about what happens next turn. 
So as you can see, I've got four mana, one you count four cards, and this card requires one black and three other. So three plus one equals four. Um, I don't think we need to get that basic. No, no. Some some people might assume it's three of three of the black. I remember making that mistake once myself. Fair. It, it is, here's a vampire. That that is uh, a vampire. And it has a neat ability that says whenever another creature I control dies, Vindictive Vampire deals one damage to each opponent and I gain one life. Which makes this attack a little bit more viable. Uh, okay, let's do this. It's not the best move in the world, but I want to get some action. So for a start... Chris had yeah. uh, the the centipede had a thing on it where when it dies, put a one one token on a creature that he controls, uh, which means that the vindictive vampire has now got even tougher. Um, and obviously, I took one shot to the face, and he gained a life because the vindictive vampire was vindictive, yeah, and a vampire. But, you know, Lava Coil is what? Two mana? Uh, so, about the speed of cards. Because that might come up in a moment. There are typically two speeds of cards. Uh, sorceries, which you can play on your main step. And instants that can be played at any time. So for instance, I can turn these two creatures sideways and attempt to slap Chris in the face for two points and wait to see his reaction. The competitive nature of me <laughs> no, well, the competitive nature of me knows that I shouldn't block. The instructor in me says I should block <laughs> because John's going to do something that's going to affect the stack so the question is do you want to win the game or do you want to teach people to play magic I'm going to teach people how to play magic and I'm going to be really sore that you're going to shock my uh, vindictive vampire cool so I will John's coming at me with these two goblins I don't want to get slapped in the face with a goblin so I get to choose whether or not I let this damage go to my face, like as these arrows are indicating right here, um, or I can put one of my guys, i.e. this vampire, in the way of one of these. So one one creature can block one thing, unless it ha unless the card, which goes back to saying card overrides, some cards will say can block more than one creature this turn. Specific so my, beats general. So my vindictive vampire is going to choose to block the instigator like this and I'd say okay yep to damage so at so, this point mm -hmm. I'm going to play sure strike uh, which means that my goblin instigator got plus three and first strike so he could so because that card is an instant he can play that in response to anything at any point in the game um, generally there are mechanics which prevent that from happening one particular one's called split second but i don't think that's actually in current meta so he i declared my block normally my vindictive vampire which was stronger would eat the goblin um but he then cast a spell on his goblin to make it more powerful i had no response so the goblin hit first which is uh, another mechanic first strike um you'll find in mtg if you um select a card if it has a funky mechanic like first strike, it will tell you. So if John highlights the sure strike in his graveyard, you'll see that first strike. First strike. Pops a creature with first strike deals combat damage before creatures without first strike. Um, so it's my turn now. Um, I'm going to play a swamp, and what's better than one vindictive vampire? It's, it's two vindictive vampires. So I'm going to play another vindictive vampire. Well, what's better than uh, one vindictive vampire? It's the second one that comes out after the first one went away. 
Yeah, so that, it's that vindictive. It just keeps coming at you. That's really um, vindictive. And I have this card in my hand, which again is an instant, so I don't have to play it right now. I can wait to see what happens during the next phase of the game. I have one mana up, which means I can cast it. Um, and I, so I don't have to do anything right now. I can just go, okay, John, it's, it's your go. I can't do anything else. Um, and just let this play out. So John could play something and I'll be like, no, I don't want that. I want to do this instead or to basically it, it's called, it's called response. And you'll, if you're playing magic at an LGS or anything like that, you'll sometimes hear people say any response, any effects. Uh, and that it, it's be... plighter to be like, do you want to react to this? Like, is there anything you can do at this point? Yeah. Uh, Arena obviously knows that you have that, that Chris might have a card to play, or that I might have a card to play, and it will hold the game up to say like, hey, you, you can do a thing. And sometimes yes. that's great. Sometimes that's very annoying. But you can skip. And if you don't, if you want to stop at certain points, um, behind my face there are the um, stop points, which you can mouse over, and it will automatically pause and say, "Hey, you've you've stopped at this point. What did you want to do?" You can also do it up here, and the tooltips are quite explanatory. So, hey, up hey. you can draw first main, second main, and end step. Hey, Chris, do you know hey, what's John. better than a vindictive vampire? Uh, another goblin. Uh, no, because we're going to go with alliterative creatures. It okay. would be a demanding dragon. Oh, very nice. Mm. It deals five damage to target opponent unless that opponent, unless that player sacrifices a creature. Yeah. It it demands that you go away. That is a very demanding dragon. Um, in response, I'm I don't like the sound honest. of that. That sounds like you have a response. So I'm going to cast this figure. And as you can see on the uh, directly above me, the stack is starting to build. You see my disfigure is to in on top of the dragon. So whatever happens now, my disfigure will resolve before the dragon. So if I target this goblin with this figure, it dies. Oh. My goblin got all disfigured. So I can choose to either sacrifice my vampire or take five damage uh, i'm going to submit zero which means i'm not submitting any creatures to the dragon so you'll notice that my dragon says it deals it to target opponent and in this game i only have one opponent that's chris mm -hmm. uh so it's not giving me a choice of who i target with it uh no, the goblin can stay here and not go in and fight and just die to the vampire. So at this point in the game, I want to talk about um, themes, color themes, right? So as you can see, the red, he got creatures out very quickly. He had spells to pump and make these tiny creatures big. He had this demanding dragon, which is dealing damage. It's like sac sacrifice a creature or I'm going to hurt you. So it's very quick, very aggro based. Black is a little bit more subvertive. We had the spell earlier, which put minus one, minus one counters on um, a creature. Sometimes that's enough to kill it. Basically, when a creature's toughness reaches zero, it dies. Um, or you can use it to make a strong creature like the dragon. You can make it a bit weaker, so maybe one of my creatures can do it. Uh, can do more damage and finish it off. There are also other mechanics that favors black. And John Dow probably understands what is coming. I'm, I'm not happy about it, but carry on. Um, one type of thing that Black loves doing is what's called removal, which basically says it's going to happen really quickly. The three words on this card are very literal. There's no tricks or anything to it. It's just a straight-up murder. No damage dealt, nothing. That creature could have been a 12-12. It just well, goes away. It, it's just gone. And that's that's black. <laughs> so then I just choose to hit you. I will... Uh, this is what my goblin is for. 
at this point in the game, my 1-1 goblin is now more a... Hey, get in there and stop me from being hurt now, please. So what John is doing is, is known as chump blocking, which means you get a little tiny chump and you put it in front of the big thing. That's chump blocking. Hey Chris, I got another dragon. I know. When Sparkchon Dragon enters the battlefield, you may pay two and one red. When you do, it deals three damage to any target. So John didn't pay the, the four, uh, three mana required. So I don't get burned. Spark uh, Spark Tongue Dragon doesn't seem quite as good as Demanding Dragon. I think it's better when you have more mana because three yeah. damage is is a lot, a lot of damage. Generally, creatures. Will be one one two twos two threes and then you start going to like the five five six sixes and then if you're playing green it's sky's the limit really yeah green can get a bit crazy with that so i'm going to play the swamp so i now have seven lands and i'm going to play the bloodthirsty aerialist which has flying and flying is another mechanic and you've seen it with the dragons um so a creature with flying can fly over creatures that don't. So his Spark Tongue Dragon could fly over my Vindictive Vampire. Because my Vindictive Vampire doesn't have flying, the creature can go straight over and go straight from my face. All, all the creature can do is watch as the creature flies over its head. Exactly. And a creature with flying can block another creature with flying. So I now have a flyer. John now has a flyer. Uh, We're all flying. We're all flying here. Who's that pyromancer again? You know him, you love him, it's the pyromancer. Notice how a lot of John's spells are attacking my my health directly, my my life points. Um That's that's one of the traits of red where it goes goes straight for the throat, it's very quick, you can't what's it's called direct damage and it generally doesn't interact with any of the creatures on the board. It's just like, I'm going for your face. Now, while Chris does have a flyer, his flyer is a 2-3, and my Spark Tongue Dragon is a 3-3. So, mm. he doesn't deal enough damage to kill the dragon, but my dragon deals enough damage to kill the aerialist. So, either he can keep that flyer back now and come at my life points directly because my dragon's going to be turned sideways and unable to block, or he can sacrifice the bloodthirsty aerialist to not be hit in the face. Mm -hmm. So I could use the, the aerialist as a blocker to make not take three damage this turn, but I'm on 11 life points. I've got to be careful because he might have more of that deliciously red burn that he's got. You know, as my life top points tick down, he's going to be like bang, bang, bang with the fireballs and there's going to be flames and blood everywhere. But I'm going to risk it for a biscuit and I'm not going to block just to see what's happening. Three I'm going to hit him in the face. Ooh. Ooh. So the problem is now my dragon is tapped, which means I can't use it to defend, and Chris has a flyer still, which means he can punch me in the face with it. If he doesn't care about blocking with it, we'll come to that in a moment. If he doesn't care about blocking with it, he can now fly over and punch me in the face, and I don't like being punched in the face. No. Meanwhile, Chris has brought out the Vampire of the Dire Moon, or at the very least is attempting to at the moment bring it out. I have to let it resolve, because I have a instant that I can play at this point. Um, so this is a 1-1 one -one with Death Touch and Life Link. Death Touch means that any amount of damage the source deals to a creature is enough to destroy it. It doesn't care about how much toughness it has. So think back to that removal spell murder. So basically I can touch, if I death touch something that's a 7-7 seven, seven, it's going to die because consider it like a poison touch it's going to finish it off completely. And lifelink um, means how much damage um, it, the vampire deals will also restore that many life points to me. So it's, it's a two, two way kind of, I'm going to kill you but I'm also going to take your life. But it's also a 1-1, one -one, which makes it very weak and open to 
pretty much all of John's spells right now. Um, Curiosa and Curiosa. I've allowed it to resolve. My vindictive vampire is feeling vindictive. Hmm. I have a choice to make at this point. And I think I'm going to do this. I'm going to block with the Vashino Pyromancer. Uh, the Pyromancer does two damage to this three toughness creature, but also takes two damage from the creature to its one life. That means the uh, Vindictive Vampire kills my creature but doesn't die to it. John's doing some math right now. However, the damage that the creature takes stays until the end of Chris's turn, and so until Chris's end step finishes resolving, that creature is now a 2-1 because it has dealt it has been dealt damage. Thereby, if I shock it for two, it Ouch. goes away. Yeah, so damage is persistent until the end of the turn, then all creatures that took damage heal. Um, at this point, I have no cards in my hand, and therefore Chris knows that I've not got anything kept back, therefore I'm going to just not attack. Curses. I drew a mountain. So, I have options here, and I'm going to do a little cool... Well, I'm going to attempt something, something cool. I'm going to attempt to stop him from doing that, because when he does cool things, I get upset. So, this card that I have has potential to be fun. And I'm going to let it play out, because I don't want to give too much away for John. And I'm going to hope that he's also going to <laughs> uh, engage his teaching head. And, well, either way, let's just roll with it. So we go to combat. We declare attack. I attack with my vampire of the diamond. Now, I want you to want you guys to read the text. Remember we talked about lifelink, about gaining life. And then we've got this interaction here. Uh, and so... So now I can... I can block his creature, but that will kill my Spark Tongue Dragon. That won't. It will, because you've got Death Touch. Because I've read the card. <laughs> um... It will do one damage to my Spark Tongue Dragon and kill me, which also will give Chris back one health. Or I could let it through, it deals one damage to me, and Chris will get one health, and I will still have a dragon. And you see the trigger on the Bloodthirsty Area list, which says whenever I gain life, I get to put a 1-1 one, one counter on the Bloodthirsty Area list, which will take her toughness up to 4 which is one higher than the three that the dragon will be able to deal to it. So I have an affected blocker versus his spark time dragon. So all in all, this is not good for me. I'm not going to block. Cool. To damage. Ow. So, so that damage goes through. The 1-1 one, one counter goes on the bloodthirsty aerialist. It's now a 3-4. I now have an effective blocker versus his spark time dragon. And I also have this card held back, just in case John decides to play it in red shenanigans. You know what I've got in terms of red shenanigans? It's goblins. More goblins. Well, that's fine. And this goblin comes with more goblins. More goblins. Gore moblins. It's all about them goblins. I'm not going to attack until I've got something to do about the Bloodthirsty also, area list. Also bear in mind that the decks we're using are ones that you are given for free. When you sign up for Magic the Gathering Arena, you get given these decks. 
Um, you unlock them during the course of you to, of the tutorial. Um, we haven't paid any money for these for these decks. We haven't used any of our um, in-game currency for these decks. As you progress through the tutorial, you get given them. Um, and so you'll be able to jump in straight away. Hashtag not sponsored, by the way. Um, and I will pass to the end of your combat and begin my turn. And here we go. John, remember those uh, those vampires? Are they feeling vindictive again, Chris? Just a little bit. They're really vindictive, your vampires. They are really vindictive. So I'm going to try something, again, really cool. So I'm going to go to combat. I'm going to declare attacks. Now this time I've got creatures that I can easily throw in the way of this, and so I'm going to do that. Now, I'm banking on this ability more than this ability. I'm happy to let the vampire die, because I'm going to get two triggers on my bloodthirsty aerialist. Ow. And that happened. It, it resolved all at once, but basically what happened is I gained a life um, from the lifelink, which put a counter on the area list. And then when the vampire itself died, I got a trigger from the vindictive vampire, which said, if a creature I can, another creature I control dies, deal one damage and gain a life. So that's two separate gain life triggers that went on the stack to put two plus one, one plus one counters on the area list, which has now made it bigger than most dragons yep. and again we still have this card in hand which will also help should we need to use it and I will end my turn so I now have something that's big enough to block the goblin instigator and something big enough to block this here dragon so things are coming up millhouse they were coming up millhouse I have a dragon egg you do so can I can I have a dragon egg? You could, I'll let you have a dragon egg. Yay! So the dragon egg has defender, which means it can't attack. It can uh, defend. It can defend, and when it dies, it creates a dragon, which then has an ability which can with what we call pumping, where you can pay one mana at a time and give it plus one on its attack. It's not a one-time deal. You can pay as much mana as you've got spare to increase the damage of this dragon. So John has seven mana. So if he somehow gets this dragon out, he can then one turn pump it for seven and make it a nine-two. Nine on the front to so nine damage. I'm on 11 life. So I want to be really careful that that dragon doesn't hatch. Which basically means I'm going to fly right over it. Yeah, it's... um. It not perfect system. All right. Um, I best start getting involved here. <laughs> okay. At this point, I've got one creature I can flow in the way of this at mm -hmm. one time. Now, I could throw it in the way here and hope that something comes up. Or I could give it a turn. I can take the damage to the face. I'm at 17 and it's dealing 5, so I'll go down to 12. Hopefully, my next card draw will be something amazing that will deal with flying creatures my opponent controls or something along those lines. So I'm going to wait and see what happens. Take no blocks and take the damage to the face. Awesome. Ow. Crunch. I end my turn. Alternatively, the card I draw could just be a mountain. Ah, uh, ma Magic the Gathering, you sweet and cruel mistress, you. You giveth and you taketh awayeth. And right now she is taking the effeth awayeth. 
Uh, I mean, I could try and just punch you with the goblins, but I get the feeling you might even just block that. Nah. Nah? End of combat. It's a bit of a standoff. It's a, it's a bit of a clock going here, really. Um, yeah, it is a bit of a clock. Now I'm going to start putting the, putting the pressure on. I don't want to attack with my vampire because he's going to block with his dragon, and I don't want that dragon to hatch. So John is choosing to block this time because he doesn't want to take five damage. Nom. Nom, nom. I end my turn. And once again, the card I draw could be a mountain. So this is what we call being mana screwed. When you want decent cards, but all you get a mana, all you get a land. There's there's two forms of being mana screwed, and I'm quite proficient at both of them. <laughs> One of them is to be mana flooded, where you've got a lot of mana and nothing to do with it. The other is to be mana, what I would typically class as mana screwed, where you've got a lot of things to do and not enough mana to cast any of them, and I am very good at being both of those. Never at the same time. Shall we, shall we show off the pump mechanic? Well, we could do. Okay, because this, but... this is a learning <laughs> lesson. Now the thing is, you you have got a nice thing going here. You've got the the vampire of the dire moon there. That is, you could do the same maneuver you did previously, or do this as well. So I am going to I'm going to encourage this behavior. I don't know why I'm encouraging this behavior. <laughs> so, I'm we. We'll, I'm going to attack John. This is something you wouldn't normally do. You might do. So I'm going to attack with this. John's like, oh, that thing has death touch. That would kill my dragon egg. Well, that means that my dragon gets to come out. Uh, we deal damage. It also doesn't kill his vampire, which means that the effects that he had on the previous turn don't happen. However, the Vampire of the Blood Moon still has lifelink, which means yeah. that the blood letters, uh, the blood letter, er oh, bloodthirsty okay. aerialist, uh, still gain life, and therefore they both still get a plus one, plus one counter. He doesn't get the full effect he got the last time I threw a 1-1 one, one in front of his vampire, yeah. which killed it and caused the Vindictive Vampire to do a thing. But... It, I get a dragon, he gets a lot of plus one, plus one counters. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let those all resolve. Oop. There's the uh, dragon. I'm going to let all those resolve. Uh, and I'm going to play a swamp for the turn. And I end my turn. I'm going to allow it to be my turn now. And I could draw a mountain. <laughs> but you do, ha you do have a lot. This is another red mechanic. That's called pumping. I'm going to go to combat. But before I do that, I'm going to pump my dragon a lot. Because I can. Because I've got nothing else to do with this mana. So I'm just going to just keep clicking it. And each time I click it, it's going to turn one of my mana sideways. And, uh give it more damage. So this is this is pumping and it's it's um, a red mechanic. Normally it just increases attack. Sometimes when you get green that does pumping it does both attack and defense. So in theory this is now a 12-2 well, not in theory. This is now a 12-2 creature. Ergo, if it hits Chris in the face, Chris will die. Mm -hmm. This is what's called having lethal. 
Um, John has enough damage on the board right now to just flat out kill me. So John has lethal damage right now. He won't for long, but, you know. I'm going to enjoy it while it lasts. I'm going to say... Everybody get in there and try and punch Chris in the face, and maybe I'll confuse him and he'll block the goblin and forget the fact that the dragon is going to lethally <laughs> kill him. I get the feeling that's not going to work, but I can at least hope. It happens. Now bear in mind this dragon is 12 on the front and 2 on the back, so my 3 damage from my bloodthirsty aerialist will be enough to kill him. Um, it's still your turn, apparently. I still have to tell it that these two are going to attack. Um, so nothing I can do, not even Dark Remedy, will be able to stop this dragon from killing something. So Something is dying to the dragon. Then Whether that is Chris... That. Then do that. I do like that the bigger the creature hits are, like, the, the bigger the sound of the creature hit is, mm. like, the, the more resounding the <laughs> is. So if I play this card on this creature, I now have lethal. Because 8 plus 2 plus 1 equals 11. Ow, my face. This pump. I have been defeated. Defeated. Alright, do you want to play another deck? Yeah. Yeah, I do. Okay. Yeah. I shall play. What color are you going to play, John? I'm thinking I'm going to go with my usual. Uh, play style, I'm going to open the Walk the Plank deck and play some Demir Blue Black. You're playing Demir Blue Black? I'm playing Demir Blue Black. I would suggest you don't play Demir Blue Black, otherwise we have a very similar situation to the last night when we did the Azorius deck against each other. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, fine, fair enough. I shall play the Azorius Legion, which is red white. No. White uh, Azorius red. is blue white. Blue white, isn't it? No. Boros. Boros. I'm not playing Boros. Boros. Am I playing Boros? I must be playing Boros. So this is so, this is blue black pirates. So in this deck, it's um, it's going to have the the rush feel of red, but with the white and the white wall the white aspect brings to it is um, lots of creatures with lifelink uh, and lots of um, buffing enchantments as well. So whereas, is, uh, go on. whereas on my side of things, I'm going to have the black uh, decay, disruption type feel, but also the blue control of blocking creatures, blocking spells, uh, searching through my deck, uh, it's also going to have, and I'm sure the same is with Chris, you're going to see multicolored lands. Yeah. Uh, so we have, we have this one here, as you can see on my screen. Um, I get to choose. Uh, it works well with cards like this one. As you can see, we were talking about on the black deck, it had a number and one color. This has two colors. Um, some will have a number and two colors, which means two colorless or any color plus the colors that you need to cast etc etc so because this particular land comes into play tapped it's good to get it out turn one because it's going to untap for turn two which means you can start doing cool stuff forest guild gate and similarly oh, because this turn this this land type comes in tapped it's good to get it out turn one and it'll untap turn two uh so i've got a submerged boneyard so you can see this card right here the bonus of playing cards of multiple colors is that they generally tend to be more powerful. So, for example, this card has three unique abilities. Double Strike, Vigilance, and Trample. So, Double Strike deals 
first strike damage like we saw in the last game and regular damage so it can hit twice. Vigilance means it doesn't tap after I attack with it so it can block the, the turn after it attacks. And trample means if I kill a blocker, the remaining damage goes through to the face or through to the next blocker. Normally when you block, the damage goes in and if it's, te it's a 10-10 versus a 1-1, one -one, the 1-1 one -one just dies and nothing happens. But if it's a 10-10 versus a 1-1 one -one with trample, then one damage gets absorbed by the defense and then the 9 travels on to the next blocker but generally onto the face. Hey Chris, it's a go 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 ghost. A go 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 ghost. Now uh, the only problem, the only problem is with with the decks of multicolors is that the card text generally tends to be longer. Cards will have multiple abilities, and like you can see with this departed deck hand, um, when it becomes a target of a spell, sacrifice it. Um, it can't be blocked except by spirits, and it has an ability on it as well. So it yeah, gets... there's a lot of text on some of these cards. There is, yes. But you can also break that down. Like, each of these lines of text, each of these sentences are separate. So, some of the cards, like my Kite Sail uh, Freebooter, has a lot of text in one block, which means it all relates to the same thing. Whereas with the Departed Deckhand, it's got three blocks of text in the one space. It's it's a lot of text, but it's not all related to the same thing. Yeah. That goblin had to die. Okay. You know what? I don't like the look of that uh, Swiftblade Vindicator. Really? So, um... Bye. So that was a bounce ability. It put it back in my hand. You got a lot of tutus there. I, I've so. got a few tutus. Got a few so tutus. I'm going to try and perform a combo. Um, and for that, I need this. I can't play the guild gate. So I'm going to play this, uh, and then I'm going to go to combat, and I'm going to all attack. My combo didn't work because of the stupid goblin. <laughs> oh well. You have no board. It's fine. <laughs> I'll take it. Uh, um... So what I was hoping for was Mentor would trigger and put it on the Swift Blade Vindicator. Right. I don't know why? It's a g -g 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 ghost. Oh, on target a attacking creature. That's why. Because I, I should have been attacking with it. Not the g -g 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 ghost. It's another g -g 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 ghost. Right, okay. He misses his friend. They missed each other. Um, just need to read some of these cards one moment. <laughs> I also have a pirate on a kite. Wow. Um, my pirate on a kite is just going to come over and grab some stuff from you. I hope you don't mind if I hold on to this for a few minutes. I mean... You you can have it back when my pirate on a kite goes away again. Which I get the feeling will be soon. I mean, possibly. Hey, he brought some friends with him. Uh huh. Well, here have a swamp, and then fathom, f fathom fleet border. Now he has an ability that if he enters the battlefield, I would lose two life unless I control another pirate. Which is why I didn't play him last turn when I didn't control another pirate. Hmm. Um, 
I am then going to go to combat. I'm going to then declare attackers. And then I'm going to say that all of my pirates who can on this turn get in there, go and punch Chris. Which is those two. Yeah. I'm getting punched. I mean, how does a ghost attack me? <laughs> Being ghosted. That 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 works. Okay. Um. What do I want to do here? Um, that Fathom Fleet border is really annoying. I'm just going to hold back until... Yeah. See, the problem with, with John's deck is that there's blue in it, which can do the bouncy stuff. And then there's black, which does the removal stuff. Oh, more pirates. Yes, scoundrel. It's a grasping scoundrel. Um, so some decks have themes like the one that John's playing. Um, sometimes it's referred to as tri. But are all pirates, so he might have a card in there that says all pirates get a bonus, or um, or like the Fathom Fleet border deals with the fact that if I don't have another pirate, he stabs me. So I'm going to once again go to combat and say all y'all who can attack, go and punch Chris in the face. I'm going to see what Chris does at this point. I said I'm going to see what Chris does at this point. Uh, apparently what Chris does at this point is lose connection to the internet. Chris will be right back after these short commercial messages, hopefully. How are all of you? Didn't really have anything planned for if Chris went away while we were doing this. On Friday this week, um, stay tuned to the stream as uh, I will be joining the A-team of Space Odysseus once again for more sci-fi based action and adventure. On Sunday, uh, well, on Friday we're hopefully going to be clearing out the Mirage base and finishing off the little mission we've been doing for the last couple of months. Um... On Sunday, Storm King's Thunder will be searching for the missing Storm King of the title of that adventure, and hopefully finding and rescuing him from the Morkoth, a mysterious pirate ship. Um, Monday next week, Sean and I will be back stargazing on the uh, Direwolf 20 server as we will continue to work through some of the higher level magic bits and pieces 
of blood magic and astral sorcery. I can hear hey. Chris typing again, which means that I can stop promoting streams that are upcoming and get back to this game that is in progress, hopefully. Apologies for that one. Um, my internet just decided to just uh, do the thing. Just, just to go away. Just to go away. It took a break. Are you are you back in the game? Um, I'm not. I might have lost connection. Oh. Uh, As which... in, I might have lost connection to that game. But we'll see. It it doesn't say that you've gone away. So hopefully it will let you pick it up. We shall see. Hopefully. Hopefully. Uh, Wednesday next week will be something else. I don't know. We might do... Uh, might do another stream, uh, like a video game stream, which will be crazy, I know. Hold up. I get to choose blockers. Wait, what? I turned some, I turned some guys sideways. Right. Okay, and so came okay. to punch you in the face. You have untapped mana and you're attacking with a flying thing. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty sure I have. Oh, I, mm. That shouldn't worry you at all. I mean, no. No. There's a ghost. Do, do you have ghosts? You can't block ghosts. Oh, I'll, I'll take the. So flash works for creatures in much the same way that uh, instant works for magic cards, sorcery cards. In that it can be played at any time. Rolls into it like he's teaching something. Oh, by the way, I've got flash. Yes, carry on. Uh, when the dire fleet poisoner arrives, they throw some poison to their friend, uh, pirate, and the per person gets a plus one plus one and death touch until the end of turn. All right, so this works in my favour. No. Well, let's get rid of this guy. Let's yeah, get rid of get rid of. No, we can't get rid of. We can stop him or we could not. Let's do the not. <laughs> Double punch. Hey, I got another submerged boneyard. I think I should um, re-enable my chatbot one second. Connect. Connect. Sorry, chat. Oh, there's that dude again. Although I can't stop him this time. I mean, technically I could have also punched with my departed deck hand because you can't block a ghost because it's a ghost. Nope, you can't block a ghost. But I didn't. So there you go. Right. What of my effects are you reminding me I can do? Oh, is it that one? Cool. I shall remember that. <laughs> that one? Wait, now I get to check. Oh yeah, look at that. Yeah, that's a th that's a thing I can do with unspent mana. That's the thing you can do with unspent mana. Well, there's only one thing to do in an instance like this. Swing with a team. Resolve. He has a lot of mana up there. Because blue. You, you, you. Oh, sod it. Those guys can get through. Hmm. Ow. Trample on through. I'm coming. Interesting. 
Oh, poo. There are no attacks. Punch him in the face, flame man. Oh no, he's got a burb. I have a burb. I may have made a tactical error. Get in there and chump block. He has to block. So with the white, so you got the red of the rush, the aggro, the attacking all the time, and then you have the white ability of making my little guys that normally come out of red stronger. Uh, no blocks. No blocks it, for now. It's a pretty powerful maneuver. Uh huh. Little little guys come out, big guys. Big big guys to deal with soon. I think we saw this is the win, isn't it? Pretty much. Burb, burb, uh. That's a swole burb. Oh, the swole. It's a real swole burb. Blocky guy, be blocky that guy. Ow. Bird. Picatory. Uh, to break down the highly technical jargon we used at the end there, a real swole burb <laughs> is a very powerful bird creature. Yes. That just punched me in the face. It pecked you to death. Literally, a bird that gives me life pecked you to death. Shall we do one more match? One more match. One more match. Uh, I'm gonna go... Boros Battalion, Azorius Senate... Can Celes I use one of my historic decks? Go ahead. Cool. I'm gonna use Chaos and Mayhem, which is a black-red deck. Hmm. Um, what? Sparky? No, no, wait, no. Uh, I concede to you, Sparky. Sorry. D did you do the wrong thing? Yeah. What did I, what did I do there? I think you did a bot, oh, bot match. match. Okay, sorry. Challenge me, not Sparky. Okay. Let's do dumb. John doesn't like this deck. Uh oh. That's not a good intro to this. <laughs> oh, that's a lot of lands. That's a decent number of lands. It's got some stuff to do. Uh, I'm a keep. I'm also gonna keep. I'm probably not going to explain a lot what's going on in this deck because it's rather complicated. But the basic mechanic is I want spells in my graveyard. Because they make everything stronger. Um, yes. Wait. I, I want him in that order, actually. Thank you. This is one of these complicated decks where if it works, it's going to be really good. If it fails, it fails spectacularly. I have a doomed dissenter. Oh, I see. It's a 1-1 one, one, that when it dies, it becomes a 2-2. Two, because two. zombies are better than people. Um, kind of going to have to deal with that that way. Uh, yep, 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 yep. Well, I've, I've sure got a lot of mana in this hand at the moment. Sounding. Hey, uh, Miss, Mr. Dissenter, could you go punch him in the face, please? There's actually a very effective strategy versus his deck. <laughs> um, 
How about some overkill? Actually, no, let's do this. Yeah. Hey. Hey. That's a, that's a thing. It is a thing. Cool. Oh, look, it did it's a little a thing. It's the Berber death. That doesn't die. Don't like burbs. Woof. So I this, <laughs> so this type of uh, dual land has the clause: it enters the battlefield tapped unless you control a swamp or mountain, which makes it useful to play after the first turn. Mm -hmm. I uh, have a similar card. I'm now going to punch Chris in the face again with a Doom Dissenter dude. That Doom Dissenter is going to work, that's all I'm saying. He is. He's not very doomed at the moment. He's mostly just dissenting. Okay, I'm going to hold fire on doing anything. Just, just in general? Just in general. Okay, I'm going to play a mountain. Cool. And then I'm going to play a ravenous harpy. The harpy is real hungry. Harpies are a thing. Uh, and actually, I'm going to then use its ability, because I can. It's going to sacrifice the Doom Dissenter to the harpy, which is going to make you a zombie. Yeah. That's synergy. <laughs> and then I'm going to go to combat. And then... I'm going to end my turn, because I don't have anybody that can attack right now. Because they're all real tired. Right. So, let's look at the text on the Arclight Phoenix. Do we have um, to? It says, at the beginning of your combat, if you cast three or more instants or sorceries this turn, return Arclight Phoenix from the graveyard to the battle. And it also has haste, which means... Now, normally, you when you play a card, like a creature card, you see this harpy and this zombie have got this uh, aura around it. It's summoning sick, which means you can't normally attack with it the turn that you play it. But creatures with haste are not summoning sick, so they will come into play and they can attack straight away. So if we look at my hand and we look at the text in the Arclight Phoenix, we can do a lot here. I don't like uh, it when he says things like that. This is this is when like decks will you know they they can maybe get a little bit complex. So I'm going to pay two life to make sure I have enough mana to pull off all the tricks that I want to pull off today. Um, so first of all, um, oh, yeah. So I'm going to Lava Coil the Harpy. Oh. Yes. I'm going to Lava Coil the Zombie. Oh. To add insult to injury, I'm going to shock John in the face. Oh. Then my Arclight Phoenix comes back from the graveyard. Which also punches John in the face. So, at this point, I'll place this swamp down that I just drew. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to say, hey, Arclight Phoenix. Yeah, <laughs> punch me in the face. Go, go punch him in the face. Is that till end of turn? Yeah. Yeah. And then I'm going to end my turn. Have your okay. phoenix back. So, remember when I said that I wanted a lot of instants and sorceries in my graveyard? This card is a reason for that. Uh-oh. Uh, so, the fact that I can play cards and get my Arclight Phoenix back will also buff this guy, the Crackling Drake. Um, works well. And then the phoenix will punch you. Ow. So the Crackling Drake's power and toughness uh, power is equal to the total number of instants and sorceries in my graveyard. Um, in terms of technical jargon, the Crackling Drake would be classified as a bomb, the, the main focus of the deck. Uh, sort of the win condition, the, yeah, the thing you're condition. aiming for. Yeah. Um, when you manage to get it out onto the field and you've managed to set up in a certain amount for it to be doing the thing it's meant to do, it is classified as going off. Yeah. 
another term for that is engine, and that's when two cards work together to create your victory condition. The Crackling Drake is a bomb because you drop it and it's instantly big and scary. Whereas, if you remember, I had the Vindictive Vampire and the other vampires gaining me life and putting counters on each other. That's a that's an engine. So, um, and an engine is something that happens every turn to make something bigger. Yeah. I know. Uh, I'm gonna borrow that Drake. Let's see, now one thing about blue is I hate blue. blue has one mechanic that we haven't showcased yet, and that's called counterspell. Oh, I hate you. Counterspells are like destroy target spell that you're attempting to cast. Um, and so I'm going to what's that nine damage? You see this card here, it says draw two cards, then discard a card unless you've attacked with a creature. So I'm going to want to draw two cards. So I'm going to do that. Ow. I'm going to draw my two cards. And you see this Crackling Drake is the... Um, the Crackling Drake is its power and toughness. It, uh, its power is equal to the amount of cards in my graveyard. The Enigma Drake is the same. What do you do? That sucks. I, on the other hand, have been mana flooded this game. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, it's it's fine. It happens, but it sucks. But it happens. Send in the drakes. Ow! Ow! Boop. So, what you can. Uh, ascertain from that is you you start with the co the concept of magic is you have these these single color decks um, and you have the basic dual color decks and then you can start going up to decks in the meta where like that particular crackling drake deck was part of the old meta now the new cards have come in a lot of the cards in that deck are no longer used yeah but it's it's an example of some of the higher level play stuff where all of the cards have a lot of text and there's a lot of what we call interaction between them. In this, in the case of my deck, the cards interacted with my graveyard and it actually required normally the graveyard is the place, once things go there, they're no good to you. But in the in this instance, and you'll find in the Golgari, which is green-black Yeah, a lot of, a lot of deck matters. A lot of graveyard yeah. matters decks. So lots of zones um, in the game can start coming uh, very viable, like Green Black will want you to have creatures in your graveyard to be able to pull them out straight from the battlefield in a zombie-esque fashion. The it's it's it kind of the recycler uh, approach. Um, the Is It deck that I just use, um, its strength comes from you casting spells and having those spells in your graveyard. Um, the, uh, there's some mechanics in there that say get a card out of your graveyard again, cast it again. Um, there are cards that want to be in the graveyard because they offer you more than they are on the battlefield. Um, and the same with the exile zone. Normally exiles out of the game, but as you get into advanced play, um, you find that every zone's viable and you can create decks that have a lot of flavor. So the, the Golgari stuff is very zombie reanimating. The pirate deck that John played beforehand it has themes and feels of skullduggery because you're you're sneaking around you're making discard cards you're stealing cards and holding on to them it's a very fiend pirate thing the dragon deck he played before where there's fireballs going to the face it again has the theme and feel um and with with this example the green decks that you'll play where you create these you start off with druids and then you end up with huge hulking treants that just get bigger and massive multi-headed hydras um, again all on theme so um, yeah if you have a particular play style or something draws you it just just thematically you know you might not want to play a subversive deck and discard all the things I just want to have big green hydras in my deck and hit face with those you know that's an option there's more than there's more than playing oh I want to play these color combinations you can say i want to do it. i mean some people have made a deck for tribal squirrels where it just makes bounds and bounds and bounds of squirrel tokens hundreds of the damn things i that way. 
I had a friend who used some of the older unbound cards and made a chicken deck. Mm -hmm. Which also had cards in it that forced the player of the cards to do the chicken dance. Yeah, Unbound is a very funky thing. It's, um, it, it completely sidetracks the, the game and is it, yeah. silly, but... There you go. I mean, well, I think that's that's it for the stream, isn't it? That's pretty much it. Um, yeah. If you haven't done so already, please do hit that follow button, either on, on, on both mine and Chris's channels. Uh, it's a great way for you to know when we go live. Um... I have run through a number of the streams that are coming up for my side of things while Chris was gone, uh, yeah, so I won't I, I won't do that again. Um, <laughs> what I will do that I didn't get to is that at the end of the month it is MCM Comic Con, and both Chris and myself are going to be there, uh, which is which is nice. Which is rare. <laughs> <laughs> also is rare. rare. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. I'm going to be there all weekend. Chris is going to be there on the Saturday. Um, we have got a number of things going on if you are a final boss fight fan uh, and you want to come and see us uh, we have a table we're going to have exclusive merch that I'm going to be revealing more about the exclusive merch that is the first time we've done this print this is, of merch this is so exclusive that I don't even know about it. there are two people that know about it other than myself. Right, I'm going to have to uh, quiz them. <laughs> um, and I don't even know if they fully know it. Um, but basically, after this week, hopefully, I will know that that merch is definitely going to be there and we will reveal what it is. But if you want this, it is going to only be available at events that we are at. We're not going to sell it online afterwards. We're probably only going to have the first print run of it. Definitely going to only have the first print run of it in this style. If we do it again, it'll be something different. So if you want this version of it, you need to come and you need to be in the first ten people to get it from us. Oh, I like Schiller. Um, oh, we will also have... I, I want to... I, I'm going to have to request information. We'll I'm also have business up... cards. We're going to have stickers... Uh, so come and see us and collect pretty stickers, business cards. Um, I'm going to let Chris wrap up his stream. Super exclusive merchandise. Um, yeah, I need to wrap up my stream. So over at the Final Boss Fight team, Team FBF over there in Final Boss Fight Live, um, have a wonderful evening. Um, and I am going to jump out of the Discord and wrap up my stream. So thanks very much for John. I will no problem. Later on. Give you a shout soon. Right. Uh, we are also going to have on the Friday afternoon, uh, Jeff and myself have got a panel where we are going to talk past, present, and most excitingly, future of Final Boss Fight. And then on the Saturday in the evening, the last hour and a half of the MCM Comic Con. Uh, I am going to be running a D&D game live on the studio stage and we are 95% certain that we're going to actually have a table there with physical map and physical dice for at least some of the characters uh, and it's going to be our first real experience playing the game on the tabletop. So come along for that, it's going to be fun. Uh, we'll see you guys real soon for now. Thank you so much and good night.